Hey, good afternoon once again, options traders. And today we've got a little bit of a special video. I was going through my YouTube channel and just happened to notice that this video right here is the 700th video on this channel of helping traders survive the stock market jungle. So I thought let's do something a little bit special and talk about the most important options trading concept, or certainly one of the most important. And when I teach this to traders, a lot of times I find it very hard to believe. And that's why so many traders end up doing the wrong strategies for the wrong reasons and end up with bad results. So let's take a deeper dive, find out what this is all about. And as always, before we do, please be sure to click like and subscribe. It's greatly appreciated and helps to promote the channel. So let's start off with option pricing. What's the big point that I'm trying to make here? It really comes down to the idea of fair value. And when we talk about fair value in the financial markets, it means that you are expected to break even in the long run, not on any given trade, but over time. And the idea of fair value also can be carried out further to something a little bit more interesting. And what it means is that option buyers pay for any expected gains. So it doesn't matter what price you pay, but let's say it's maybe a deep in the money option, stock replacement. The stock's at 100, you buy the $80 call for 21 bucks. Now, most traders look at this and say, oh, I would never spend that much on an option because look at all of the money you could lose. Well, that's wrong. The reason you're paying 21 is that's what the option is expected to return. If you were allowed to make hundreds of trades just like this, not counting commissions, you're paying for the expected gains. On the other hand, option sellers are compensated for the expected losses. That's why you receive the premium when you're an option seller. So again, for all of you who like to sell naked puts because you think it's free money, think again. If you sell the $95 put for five bucks, even though it might be five points out of the money, yeah, it looks like it's easy money. But the reason you're collecting $5 up front is mathematically, that's what you're expected to lose. And in all of these cases, if you are paying for the expected gains or being compensated for expected losses, that means you're just breaking even over the long run. Now, again, when I present this to traders, they find that so hard to believe. And they just say, well, if I look on my broker's platform or I put an option price into a pricing model and it says it's worth five bucks, or maybe that's the actual market price, why would I pay $5 if I thought I was just going to make five? So they think this whole idea of fair value is somehow flawed. And that's what makes them want to buy cheap out of the money options or sell out of the money puts. So that's what we're going to find out in this video, the details on why this whole idea of fair value is true, that you must pay for any expected gains. So let's start by looking at a computer simulation, which we've seen before. So here we've got lots and lots of stocks, all starting with a price of 100 bucks, And we're cutting them loose for 250 trading days, roughly the number of trading days in a year. Now, even though we've got lots of stock prices here, probably hundreds or thousands, if we were to zoom in and look at very small increments out here at the what's called the terminal stock price at the end of the year, let's put them in very small buckets. So maybe stock prices between $100 and $100.10. So we're just going to look at these little 10 cent wide buckets. And if we were to plot the number of times that these stock prices landed in these small buckets, we would get a bell curve. So one of the properties here with a stock price moving through time is that if we start at 100, we would expect to end at 100. That's your best guess, no matter what the time frame is. So I've highlighted this one in red. Remember, they've all started here at 100. But notice that the red curve dipped below 100, came back up, stayed below 100, and then climbed up above 100. Over here, even well above 100. But then it dipped back down below. And it looks like out here at the very final stock price that it's pretty close to 100. But you have to understand that even though 
this particular line here in red, let's say, landed right on 100, so did lots of other lines. There are many different paths that lead to the same terminal stock price. And that's what makes the probabilities hard to figure out. And that's what makes this whole concept of fair value so elusive. But this is exactly what Black and Scholes did when they came up with their pricing model. They said, what is the probability, let's say over the course of a year, that this stock price lands at 100 or at 101? And in that case, the $100 call would have $1 worth of intrinsic value. What's the probability that the stock lands at 102, giving the $100 call $2 of intrinsic value? And if we add up all of these probabilities, multiplied by their payoffs, we could find out what you are expected to gain off of this option. And if we know how much you're expected to gain, we know how much you should pay. So, for example, we just saw this one recently as well in a recent video where I talked about where does Delta come from. Let's say that we have a stock trading for 100, 365 days to expiration, volatility 20%, we'll give it no interest rates, and the pricing model says that the $100 call is worth $7.97. So where is this price coming from? Did Black and Scholes just pull it out of the air and say that's what we think would be a fair value? No, here's the way that it works. We have a bell curve. We know that we can get probabilities underneath the bell curve. That is, after all, what we're looking at, a distribution of different probabilities. So if the current stock price is 100, we know that one standard deviation up at 20% volatility would be 120 bucks. Two standard deviations up would be 140. And the third standard deviation would be up here at 160. Now, the bell curve, the center of the bell curve, always sits right over the current stock price. So when we're trying to figure out what an option is worth, at least for a call option, we're only worried about the right side of the bell curve. Why? Because if we're valuing the $100 call to add the money, all of the prices to the left are zeros. The option expires worthless. So in terms of the payoffs, Another interesting insight when it comes to the options, for the call options, we only participate in the gains to the upside. We do not participate in losses to the downside. Puts are just the opposite. They will participate for all of the values here on the left side of the bell curve, but they do not participate in the losses on the right side. So this whole left half of the bell curve just vanishes. See, that's not true for shares of stock. If you own shares of stock at 100 and it falls to 95 or to 90, you are taking losses. That's not true for the option. You are not participating in those losses. So now let's say that the stock is somewhere between 100 and 120. We'll go right here in the middle at 110. And if the stock is 110 at expiration, then we know that the $100 call is worth 10 bucks. But we also know that the right half of this blue section right here in this curve is 34%. So the value that we should give the option or the probability of it being worth 10 is actually $10 times its corresponding probability. 34% gives it a value of about 340. But that's not the only place the stock price could land. It could land anywhere out here. So let's try one between 120 and 140. Halfway would be 130. And we know that if the stock is 130 at expiration, the $100 call is worth $30 of intrinsic value. And by a similar process, we could chop up this little gray curve until we find out the probability is roughly 13.5% times the $30 value would be 405. So we're just going to do this at every single stock price along the way. There would just be lots and lots of them with lots and lots of probabilities. But watch how close we got with just two. If we add 340 and 405, we get 745. And on the previous screen, it showed that the theoretical value is 797. Well, that's not too far off. We're only 52 cents off. And that's just from a very rough approximation. So this is all that's happening when we are looking at an option's fair value. We're just saying, what is the width of the curve, which is dictated by volatility and or time to expiration? And once we know that, 
all of the corresponding probabilities are identical. And so it becomes very easy, especially for a computer, to go through and say, here's what you should be either paying for the option or receiving if you are selling the option. But once again, when you present this to traders, they go, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Just because that's the expected payoff, why does that mean that's what I should pay for it? If I'm expected to make $7.97, why would I pay $7.97? I'd only want to pay 4 or 5 Well, that's a good question, and let's make it simpler. Let's find out exactly why this is the expected amount that you should be gaining if you're on the long side or the amount that you're losing if you're the seller. So to do that, let's do a very similar idea as a stock moving through time, but we're just going to make it simpler. Let's flip a coin four times. And let's say that you can win $1 for each head that shows. And the question is, what's the bet worth? How much should you be willing to pay for this? Well, let's just think for a moment. If somebody offered you this game for free, there'd be no reason to turn it down. There's nothing here that gives you a negative payoff. So it's certainly worth something. And the question is, how much? Well, that's a tough question to figure out. Because just like with a stock's price moving through time, we have lots of different ways that we could end up with, let's say, two heads or three heads. And so the probabilities become a lot tougher to figure out. But it's exactly what's happening with a pricing model. So let's look at some examples here. On the first flip, you could get either heads or tails. What about the second flip? Well, given that you've flipped a head the first time, you could get a head the second time and have head head, or you might get a tails the second time and get head tails. Or if you flipped tails the first time, you might get a head the second time, end up with tails heads, or you might get tails and end up with tail tail. So notice that even though this is our second flip, we have four possible outcomes. And that's because we have two possible outcomes each time we flip. Two for the first times two for the second. They're independent, so we multiply them together. So it starts to grow exponentially. And that's why it becomes very hard to track the probabilities. What about on the third flip? Well, given that you've flipped head-head on your first two flips, you might get a head on the third one, get three heads in a row, or you might get a tails on the third one, end up with HHT. Or given that you have head tails after the second flip, maybe you flip a head and you get HTH. Or you could also get a tail, end up with HTT. Same thing happens over here. So we could either end up with tails, heads, heads, tails, head, tails, or we could end up on this side, tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails, tails. But take a look at after this third flip, there are now eight possibilities. And again, that's just two times two times two. It's just growing exponentially. But notice that there are multiple ways we could get heads. See, I could get two heads here by going head, head, tail, but I could also get two heads here by going HTH. I could also get two heads here by going tails, heads, heads. See, it's not super simple to figure out all of the different combinations you're going to get when you have a stock price moving through time, but this is exactly what the model is figuring out. So if we were to calculate all of these different scenarios, how many times can we get three heads? How many times can we get two heads, one, or zero? We get this. And look at that, another bell curve, just like we get with stock prices. So we see that getting zero heads or four heads are the least likely. We could also end up with two heads, the most likely. There are six ways for that to happen. So let's go and actually list these out. I'm going to put them in a different table here. We end up with 16 different combinations if we were to flip four coins. And here they are. So notice that there's only one way to get four heads, but there are four ways to get one head. See, it could occur on the first of the four. It could occur on the second, the third, or the fourth. We're just moving along this diagonal. For two heads, 
Now it becomes a lot more possibilities. There are six ways. That's what we saw in the previous chart. Then if we look at three heads, there are four ways. And this is from symmetry. You might have noticed there were four ways up here, but it's really the same problem. Notice that if we get one head, that's the same thing as saying that we got three tails. If we got three tails, we know that we must have gotten one head. So that's all that's happening here. To get three heads, it's the same as saying we must have gotten one tail. It's just the opposite side. So notice that we get this 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. That is our bell curve that we just saw. So how would we figure out what this bet is worth? Well, we know that there's one out of 16 ways that this is going to happen. And so that's a probability of 0 0.0625. Just take 1 divided by 16, but you would win 4 bucks. Remember, the game is you're going to win a dollar each time the coin lands heads. So even though it's unlikely, relatively speaking, it also has the highest payoff, another property with options. The further away you get from the current stock price, the more valuable that option becomes, but the less likely it is to occur. What about for one head? All right, there's four ways, so four out of 16, or one out of four, or 25% chance where you will win a buck. To get two heads, there are six ways, so six out of 16, or three out of eight, 0 0.375, 37.5% chance for you to win two bucks, and so on. So now let's put these into a table. So here is the 0 0.0625 times 4. That's just that right there. Here's the 0 0.25 times 1. 0 0.375 times 2. 0 0.25 times 3 is right there. 0 0.0625 times 0. If we multiply these out, probability times payoff, in this first row we get 0.25. If we do that for each row, and then sum them up, look at this, we get 2. So a couple of interesting points. First of all, this is not 0, it's not negative, it's positive, which goes back to what I said earlier. If somebody offered this game to you for free, there would be no reason to turn it down. You are expected to win 2 bucks each time that you play this. Now that's different from saying that you always win 2, because sometimes you'll win 4, Sometimes you'll win none. You might win one or three or two. But on average, you're winning two. And because of that, you should be willing to pay two. And so again, traders look at this and they go, but that makes no sense. I think you should only be able to pay 50 cents or a buck. Who's going to pay two for this? Well, this is why it's an elusive concept and why traders make so many bad decisions. So let's go over to an Excel spreadsheet and take a look at this game in the long run. All right, so now we're into our Excel spreadsheet, and let me just give you a quick look at what we've got here. I've got a thousand different flips, and here are the flips. I'm just having Excel flip a coin. So in this first row, we got tails, 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 heads. So remember, the game is that you get one dollar per head. So in this first sequence, you won a buck. But if you have to pay two dollars, remember that's what we're assuming that you're going to pay, your net was a loss of a buck. So, so far, cumulatively, you're down a buck. Second flip, you got heads, tails, tails, tails. Again, you won one dollar, had to pay two, that was a loss of one, now you're down a total of two, and so on. And this graph over here in black is just going to chart your net gains or losses. So notice that you are just going sideways over time. That's another indication of fair value. Now, another way you could kind of back into this mathematically is to say that once you understand what an average is showing you, if on average you are getting paid off two bucks, I could make this entire column right here plus two. And then when we combine them with what you're paying of minus two, they're zeros on a net basis, but see how it's in disguise. These aren't all plus twos. On average, they're plus two. But again, I could just as easily make all of those twos, and then that would make it a lot easier to see why that's an expected value of zero. 
But now where traders go, well, that makes no sense. I wouldn't be willing to pay two bucks if I were just going sideways. All right, what would you be willing to pay? Buck 50? All right, so let's say a buck 50. Well, if that were true, now look at this. See, now you're going off into almost guaranteed wins, and certainly in the long run, guaranteed wins. Well, who's going to sell you the bet? I'd certainly want that deal. I'm willing to bid a buck 60 for it. What happens? Not much different. Still looks like it's a great deal for me. Traders start competing aggressively, bid it up to a buck 90. Look at that. Still a very long term upward bias. But once we hit two, things change. Now we go sideways. It's not necessarily a great deal for the buyer, not a great deal for the seller. It's just fair. What if the price gets bid up too high? Traders get too aggressive. Let's say they bid it up to 210. Now it becomes a fabulous deal for sellers. What happens? Sellers start entering the market and pushing the price back down towards two, in which case we go back into traveling sideways. So that's the reason that we should assume that an options price that you're looking at in the market is at fair value, at least based on the consensus opinion. So the reason that you should buy an option is because you think your opinion is better than the collective opinion of the market. And that's a really shaky assumption. And that's why it's a very speculative and dangerous thing to do to try to just guess where the stock is going and buying options. Or worse yet, selling options because you think it's free money. Remember, the seller is just on the other side of this bet. If you're going, oh, I've heard you should sell an option. It's selling for two. Let's keep selling it. As soon as it goes to a buck ninety, see what's going to happen now is that the buyers have the edge. You're underwater. And the more that traders step in and start selling this, it just becomes a better and better deal for the buyers. In which case, buyers are going to step in and say, oh, I'll bid that back up to a buck eighty, buck ninety two bucks, and then we're right back to fair value. Now, a little side note, you might say, hey, wait a minute, two bucks is fair value. Why are we not traveling sideways? Remember, this is a long run average. A thousand tries is not anywhere near long term. But if we were to do this over and over and average them, you would find that you absolutely would just go sideways. So that's the logic behind it why whenever you're looking at an options price, it is not free money. If you see an option trading at five, it doesn't mean you're expected to make 10 or 15 and that somebody's giving you a great deal. Or that if you want to sell this put for five, it's because it's free money. It's not. If you're collecting five bucks from selling a put, it's because that's the amount you're expected to lose. A little different perspective from what most people tell you about selling puts. Okay, so what's the most important concept to get from this video? Always remember that option buyers pay for expected gains. That's the reason that long options have a price. They have a positive expected gain. Not negative and not break even. They have a positive expected gain. You're just looking at the profitable side of that bell curve. Everything else is zero. On the flip side, option sellers receive cash for expected losses. If you sell an option for five, it's not like somebody just says, here's a free $5 bill or $500 per contract. The reason you're collecting five bucks up front is you're expected to lose five. That's why you're being compensated five bucks. So once you understand this very elusive concept, it will hopefully change your opinion about the markets. Be very careful about buying options just because you think the stock is going up. The reason you have that opinion is probably because that's what you've been hearing in the market. Everybody has that opinion. And that means the price you're paying is probably exactly the amount that you're expected to be compensated. And again, more dangerously, be very careful about selling puts because you think that they're free money. And I've even heard this with people talking about weeklies. Oh, it's great with weeklies. Now you can get paid every single week. It's just such a fallacy.
the reason you're receiving money from selling puts is that's the amount you're expected to lose. So with that in mind, what's a better way to approach the market? Use options for what they were designed to do, and that is to hedge positions. So trade the market, but hedge your opinion. And for anyone who'd like to learn more about the arts and science of options trading, please check out the Alpha Trader course, Strategy Lab, and a Candlesticks and Technical Analysis course. It's all at optionsa-z.com. Also, please join us on Options A to Z's Facebook trading group, and you can find a link in the description below.